my head is in so much pain right now. I can't think of anything else but my head. You see this LED wall behind us? We just added some, new, some extra panels to it, and it made the wall a little bit lower. And while resetting up the lights, I stood up and I hit my head on the edge of this wall. It still hurts. I hit my head so hard, I think it rattled my brain. Seriously, I think my brain moved inside my head when it hit the screen. Has anybody ever hit their head that hard before? Comment down below, my head hurts, right? My head hurts. I hit it so hard. Every part of my body, when I hit my head, went to the aid of my head. My hands flew into action as they came up and applied pressure to the top of my head. I didn't even want to lift my hands to look because I just knew that if I let off the pressure, the blood was going to start flowing. If you've ever hit your head, you know how much they bleed. My feet stepped into motion as I was running around the stage, panicking, looking for someone to come alongside me and support me in healing my head. My eyes were watering. Every nerve in my body was reacting to the shock of hitting my head so hard. If you've ever hit your head or your knee or your elbow like that, I'm, I was almost like, I was almost like it, gagging because it hurt so bad. I briskly walked down the hallway to my wife's office and revealed to her the wound on top of my head to see if I was going to need stitches, and it turns out that I did not. Every part of my body hurt and was uh, on edge because of the pain I was experiencing in my head. For that moment, all I could focus on was the pain on my head. The head injury stood out as the most important part of my body at that moment because of the injury it was experiencing. Black lives matter. What? Where did that just come from? How are you going to pull one to the other? And if the statement that I just made shocked you, if it caused anger, if it made you want to disconnect from the live feed, we have to ask ourselves, what caused that emotion? Nobody got upset when I said, my head hurts. No one was in shock when I said, I hit my head and every part of my body went to help heal it. But I make three simple words in a specific order and it creates an emotion. Black lives matter. Currently, we are focusing on fixing a problem in our communities. Nowhere did I say that because my head hurt, my hands were not important. My hands were just as important as the head injury. The hands had to go to heal and put compression to the head. My hands matter. But right now, I'm focusing on the fact that my head hurts. My head matters. My feet matter. My hands matter. My nervous system matters because it tells me that there's pain and that something needs to be fixed. 1 Corinthians 12 in verse 21 says this, the eyes cannot say to the hands, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet that I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable 
is what we feel. And those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. And what we're being instructed here is this is how we're viewing the world. This is how we live. That if we view a part of our body that needs to be modest, then we clothe it and we cover it up differently. But it, but it goes on to say this, but God. God views things differently than the world views things. God views things differently than we view things. But God, it says, has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. God's flipped the script. He's flipped the way that we look at things. And he says, this is the heavenly perspective. This is the heavenly lifestyle. So then it goes on to tell us, what does our response need to be to his heavenly model? Watch. If one member suffers, all suffer together. Oh, my head hurts. And my hands are saying, your head is hurting? Let's apply pressure because that's what we can do. And your feet say, your head is hurting? So let's run because that's what we can do. We all play our parts because we're suffering in this together. It goes on to say, if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, he says, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Woo! I love that part right there. I love that part. We need, to, we need to sit here for a moment. He says this, we are one spiritually, spiritually in the body of Christ as a body of believers. There is no difference between us. Our spirit doesn't have a flesh. We are one body in spirit. It doesn't matter. There's no differences. But then he even, but then he's so gracious to us. He adds the flip side. He says, but you're individual members of this body. He says, you can still keep an individuality. You can still keep your cookbook. Your cookbook looks different than my cookbook. Your, your, your ethnic background looks different than my ethnic background. Your family stories are different than mine. Your heritages are different than mine. They still remain even though we are one in the body of Christ. This is just so good. This is so good. I married someone who has a different ethnic background than I do. My wife is Spanish. They make rice completely different than I do. Like, you know, we bought our rice in an Uncle Ben's bag and put it in the microwave and we had, <laughs> we had white rice and now I learned that there's this whole art form and you have to have a special pot. And like the pot is the end all be all. It's even the Tupperware that you keep it in so you can re It's a whole situation. I had to learn it. He said, well, we get to keep that. We get to keep that. But we're one in the spirit. He goes on to say this, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Then he says, are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all possess healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? He says, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. What's he saying? Are we all the same? No. Are we all going to do the same? No. Do our giftings and, and viewpoints maybe look different on certain things? Yes. But we can work together as the body with what we are called to do. The feet running me to get help. The hands applying pressure. We work as one. And then he says this, and this is the topic of our message today. He says, but I want to show you that there's still a more excellent way. Today's message, the more excellent way. The more excellent way. And those are the last words of 1 Corinthians 12. 
He says, I want to show you a more excellent way, and then the chapter ends. So that means, studying the word of God, that we need to go to 2 Corinthians 13 to begin to look at what the more excellent way is. 1 Corinthians 13 starts out like this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Hey, listen, if I just come out here and speak of my own opinion, of my own feelings, of my own aggravations, of my own frustrations, it's just going to be chaos. It's going to be clanging cymbals. It doesn't really matter. I need to speak heavenly Watch, he goes, and if I have prophetic power and understanding and all the mysteries, all the knowledge, but I don't have any faith that can move mountains, I have nothing. And then he begins to build and tell us what the more excellent way is. He says it is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. And he builds out this whole thing. He says the more excellent way is love. Love is the more excellent excellent way. But how do I do this, Pastor Mike? How can we as a body, as the body of Christ, rush to the aid of the hurting parts and understand how best to help? 1 Peter 3.8 breaks this down for us. 1 Peter 3.8 is going to come up on the screen says this, finally, anytime you see the word finally in in a writing of Paul, he's going to say, I'm going to take everything I had been saying and I'm going to sum it up. Finally. And and what we've been learning, if you read 1 Peter, uh, it kind of starts in 1 Peter 2.9, we're talking about the priesthood. We're talking about royalty. We're talking that God says that you are royalty because you belong to him. That's what this whole story is about. And he sums up, he goes, but finally, all of you, Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. And for the remainder of our time here today, we're going to break this passage down. Okay? We're going to break this passage down. And then when we're done breaking this down, I want to share with you our plans for reopening church once again. He says this, finally, in Mike McKelvey terms, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's what's up. I'm going to take everything I've been talking about and I'm going to sum it up and I'm going to put it right here. In 1 Peter 2.17, he's talking about honor. So how are we going to be this royal priesthood, this holy nation? How are we going to operate and live in honor? And he wants to put it together with five statements. And listen, community, if we're going to get this right, if we're going to fix the atmosphere in which we're living, if we're going to shift culture to the unity that Jesus Christ has brought to us, we have to get these five statements right. We have to get them right, and we have to get them right now. Okay? He says, finally, comma, all of you, everyone, Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every skin color. That's what he's saying. All of you. Listen. Everybody who's connected to the body of Christ, all of you, finally listen to what I'm about to say. He says, have unity of mind. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Have unity of mind. This means that my thoughts need to come together with your thoughts, producing new thoughts. This might be the biggest step. This might be the hardest one. That I'm taking my thoughts, coming together with your thoughts, and producing new thoughts. This is why three simple words in the beginning of my talk, provoked such an emotion. Our thoughts are not aligned. Your thoughts to those three words, my thoughts to those three words, someone else's thoughts to those three words are not aligned. We are not producing new thoughts. Here's what I know. 
Ready? Here's what I know. I don't know it all. I don't have all the answers in my mind, and neither do you. And that's where we get in trouble. We get in trouble when we actually believe that we do have all the answers and that our way is the right way because that's the way it's always been. What I've been taught is the correct teaching, and that's how it's going to be. And then someone comes along with a different perspective, and instead of learning and growing and desire to understand, we push away because this is who I am, and that's who you are, and I think this way, and you think this way, and we can never have unity of mind that way. We're seeing it right now. People are hardened in their positions. They're stuck and fixed. And we're not actually hearing what each other's saying. We're commenting on statements and we're copying and pasting what someone else said instead of searching our hearts and searching our minds. I am right and you are wrong. And the conversations that need to be happening are not happening because you think you already know the answer. Listen, your way is not right, and my way is not right. Our way is right. Let that sink in. This is what this is saying. Taking my thoughts... And your thoughts coming together to be our thoughts. Unity of mind. What do we agree on? What is the unity of our minds together? Now, yes, we can have different perspectives. But it need not lead to anger. I am more committed to this relationship than I am committed to being right. That's where we grow together. Listen, I'm going to leave you with this one on this topic. Two perspectives can lead to progress. Two perspectives can lead to progress, but we have to communicate along the way. Me against you can never lead to progress. The second word that Peter uses here, the second statement he makes is sympathy. Sympathy. Simple word, right? Yet so misunderstood. I actually don't like the definition of sympathy. The definition of sympathy goes something like having pity on somebody for their misfortune. And I think sometimes that's where we lose the importance of a word. So let's look at the etymology of the word. The etymology of the word is looking at the fact that this is a compound word, sim and uh, pathos, or pathos, okay? The definition says that I have pity on you because of your misfortune. The etymology says this. It takes the first part of the word, sim, means with, with. That's all it means, with. Pathos or patheos, feelings. With feelings. That's all the word means. With feelings. The Bible says that Jesus has sympathy on the human race because he was human. He says that he was touched by the same feelings that we had because he walked in our shoes and experienced the things that we experienced. He felt what we feel. I'll tell you this. I may never actually know what it feels like to be you, but I desire to understand. What I can feel is your aggravation. What I can feel is the frustration. What I can feel is the desire to be heard. Explain to me what it feels like to be you. 
explain to another person what it feels like to walk a day in your shoes. And here's what I would ask. When I ask that question, don't tell me someone else's story. Don't tell me someone else's story. You yourself, I want to feel you. I want to feel your life. I want to feel what is bothering you. How does it feel to fear for your life? Because I may never know that feeling. I'm standing here today and saying this, I see you. I am here. My attention is here. My eyes are here. My ears are here. And my voice is here. When we can share those feelings with each other without anger, now we have unity. First, the unity starts with thoughts, then it moves to feelings. Okay, we got to follow this. He says, fix the thoughts, like-minded, let's move to feelings. And then thirdly, thoughts, feelings, brotherly love. Thoughts, feelings, number three, brotherly love. Brotherly love simply means this, the same blood. The same blood. Same blood. We all come from Adam. Same blood. My best friend growing up, his name was Bruce. I called him Cousin Brucey. Bruce was six, eight, six foot, eight inches tall in middle school. Cousin Brucey was from Jamaica, so I got to enjoy some foods in my life that I had never experienced before when Cousin Brucey became my friend. One day, Cousin Brucey and I were out on a bike ride, and he tried to do this jump with his bike, and he failed. His knee hit the ground so hard it took all the skin off his knee. It ripped his jeans. Blood was everywhere. We got him home. And he got spanked because he ripped his jeans. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought it was funny. My parents didn't really care about his knee, but they were like, man, you ripped your jeans. Anyway, he cut his knee. He bled. He had a scab. And guess what? His blood and his scab looked just like mine. Because what I didn't tell you was, I tried the same jump, I fell the same way, and I cut my knee too. We were... We were boo-boo knee twins. We had boo-boos on our knees. Same ones, same blood, same scabs in the same place. Because we're brothers. It's never dawned on me that we weren't brothers. We had the same eternal heritage, the same blood. And that's what the Bible's saying. We have to have the brotherly love. Loving everyone, period. That's the end of the story. Loving everyone. He goes on to say the fourth thing is that we have to be tender-hearted. Tender-hearted. I've heard this said, that the only difference between being hard-hearted and hard-headed is 18 inches. The only difference between hard-hearted and hard-headed is 18 inches. Have you ever met someone who is just stubborn? They're just stubborn. Can't be told nothing. Can't tell them nothing. They know it all. They're harsh. They're aggressive. You can't have a conversation with them without a t them attacking you or someone else. They're just mean. They have a hard heart. In fact, and I'm, I'm not like, condoning this, but the Bible says that Moses wrote the bill of divorce in the case of the hard-hearted. When someone is just that way, that they've decided to harden their heart, and that they're harsh, and there's no talking to them, there's no working it out, Moses said, sign off on it. We just can't get along. Peter says, look at your heart and see if it's tender. Can someone get through to you? Can someone share their feelings with you and you like receive it as a legitimate feeling instead of cutting it off and say, oh, just grow up. Just get over it. Just get past it. 
Can I tell you this? If you can't see someone's side of the story, you're set in place, your heels are duck in, you're an immovable force, in the long run, you're going to be a lonely person. You're going to be a lonely person. I- I'm trying to help somebody right now. You're digging in, you're taking a stance, you're on your side, and you're not having this life-giving conversation with somebody. In the long run, you're going to be lonely. The final thing that we're instructed, if you want to be a royal priesthood, if you want to be a holy nation, if you want to be God's own people, if you want to live the more excellent way, he says this, ready? Number five, be humble-minded. Humble-minded. This isn't easy. This isn't easy because we all think the world revolves around us. What I want, when I want, how I want it, but it does not. And the older you get, the easier it is to think that you know it all. Been there, sonny. Done that, daughter. Been there, done it. I already know it. But wonder if you don't. Wonder if you knew your reality, but there's a new reality. We need to humble ourselves in our opinions of ourselves. There is no man supreme over another. And the Bible tells us to be like Jesus, who literally was the supreme being over all mankind, but did not use it to his own advantage. Philippians 2, 5 through 9. Have this mind among you, humble-minded. These go together. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being like in the, in the, born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And why does it say even death on the cross? Because that was the most disgraceful way to die. Therefore, anytime you see the word therefore, find out why it's therefore. What it's there for, right? Therefore, because Jesus humbled himself, the result is that God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And we could build this out, but I'll I'll get real Pentecostal if I read the rest of that verse, all right? Jesus literally could have, but he didn't. He could have used his position to literally take himself off the cross and kill everybody. But he didn't. He said, I will remain humble in this life. Let's be honest. Arrogance is a turn off to all of us. Superiority complexes is a turn off. But someone who has a position of authority but operates in humility is attractive. And this is what it means to be humble minded. Jesus could have demanded that we all got down and washed his feet. But he himself, God, humbled himself and washed our feet. And in the moment of foot washing, where God Almighty came to earth and washed the feet of man, there was an atmosphere change. It came alive. To get into unity, we have to begin with honor. Honor. Here on team, on staff, we say we honor up, we honor down, we honor all the way around. We're honoring, 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 honoring. Now, yes, do we have jokes? Do we bust on each other? Yes, we love doing that kind of stuff. But when 
Pastor Josh or Pastor John Mark or Pastor Earl or Pastor Michael or Pastor Joe or Miss Lynn, when, when, when someone other than myself is preaching, guess where I am? I'm, if I'm not on vacation, I'm on the front row taking notes and rooting them on. When it's their turn, I'm in service to them. In order for my head to heal from its boo-boo, all the parts of my body need to work together to bring about the healing process. Every part of my body matters in the healing process process. But until my head heals, that's what I'm focusing on. And I'm going to go get the antibiotics, and I'm going to go get the ointments, and I'm going to put the band-aid on it, and I'm going to baby that thing until it heals. That's the focus. And I'm standing here today in front of you leading a very large church where our mission statement, our, our, our vision statement is this. Family church is a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. We were made for this moment. The vision statement was written for a moment like this. Some people have asked me, Pastor Mike, why did the church stay quiet so long? Didn't, did you not have anything to say? That's why I posted the scripture in James where it said, be quick to listen, slow to speak. For someone like me, it's been a life mission to learn how to do that. I can jump in and be in any fight and any argument. But what's my part to play in this? What part of the spiritual body am I and how do I lead this best? Part of me felt that the vision statement said enough, but it didn't. Part of me felt as churches, and if you're another pastor watching this, we can't simply pray for change. We have to be the change. We have to lead the change. We have to be the catalyst of change. I want you to understand this. If you're watching me today and you're feeling some sort of emotion about what I'm saying, I love you. I love you. Maybe you haven't heard that lately. Maybe you haven't heard it enough. I love you. And I'm not going to sit here and say, well, Jesus loves you. I love you. I love you. Get that in your spirit. Get that in your soul. Get that in your body. I love you. If you are offended by today's message, I'm sorry that you are choosing to be offended. Because nothing in what I said is offensive. It's truth. Take that up with the Bible. Pray and seek the Lord. Because all we did was look at scriptures. If you are angry today, then use the anger for good. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. So between you and God, figure out how to be angry and sin not. How to use that anger for righteous good. And let me close with a question today. If this message somehow negatively impacted you. Let me ask you this question. Do you want me to preach the scriptures or only the parts that you agree with? Because the Bible tells us we are instructed to preach the whole counsel. The whole counsel. The whole picture. I promise you, in the most humble way that I can say this, this message today is the most balanced and complete teaching I've heard yet on this topic. And this is why our church took so long to make any statement. It needs to be right. 
it needs to be biblically sound. So first, I needed to be educated. Secondly, we needed to seek the Lord as to what our body part was to play in this. Thirdly, we needed a scriptural basis for, for our stance. And this is what the Lord showed us. We are diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Ready? Here we go. Healing hurts. If you're hurting today, reach out to us. We did not, we're not taking one side or another. We're not taking political sides. None of this is being said. We're not taking uh, um, um, skin color side. We're not taking police side. We're, healing hurts. Healing hurts. I want to pray with you today. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray right now that, they can, that we can have unity of mind that we can be tender hearted. I pray right now for those who are feeling tremendous amounts of anger and rage and discomfort, maybe depression, maybe fear. I bind that spirit of fear right now in the name of Jesus. I pray that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding would flow richly in your household right now in the name of Jesus. That God would give you wisdom beyond your years, to speak life to those who are around you. I thank you for an atmosphere of positivity coming into your life right now in the name of Jesus, that negativity would flee. I thank you, Lord, that the peace of God would rain, rain down from the heavens and rain up within us and overflow in our lives. Help us to have the conversations that we need to have. Help us to be life-giving to those around us. Help us to get rid of all anger and all malice, that we would just push it out of our lives, and that the grace of God and the peace of God would flow through us. Lord, I thank you for those who are watching today, that the Holy Spirit would be their comforter. He would be their guide. He would be the healer of that broken heart right now, touching their lives, speaking truth into their spirit, man. Lord, I thank you and I praise you that everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. Oh, wait, I forgot to tell you what our plan was for reopening. I got ahead of myself right now. I love you, amen. Finish the prayer. Here's our plan for reopening. Are you ready? We are going to reopen our doors to the public July the 12th. July the 12th. Go ahead and mark that down on your calendar. July the 12th. Uh, maybe you're wondering why we're not opening sooner since we are allowed to. We're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. We like gutted this place and started like changing things all around. So we're not ready to open yet. And we did not want to open July 5th because you're probably going to be on vacation because of July 4th. July 12th is the date. Open to the public July 12th. It's going to look different. You will have to pre-register for service because space will be limited. And we'll give you more details about that. Uh, before that happens, we are going to be having meetings and services. But for the general public, everything will remain online until July the 12th. Even when we resume live services on July 12th, everything will still be available online, live as it's happening, and we will not change that system of what we've created. All right? So if you have any questions or comments, reach out to someone in the church. You can call the church office. We are here available for you. Love you. Have a good time.